disaster. Now we're looking at nuclear disaster of some type. Could be happening right now, tomorrow, next week, before the new year or after the new year. Risk level, 9 out of 10. Maybe, high, maybe you know, 9.5. We're in the middle of a 2.5 year global pandemic. We're in the middle of a billion people dying in the next three years from famine. People go, well, like, how bad is going to be back in the United States? It's like, eh, we're going to have some famine. Well, what's our shortages? I go, no, no, no. Stop using the word shortages. Outages. This book was written absolutely for you to be able to survive everything from trans-Pacific fallout to iodine falling. You're getting a direct close radioactive dose from those items in your body and that is the problem. Nate and I right now are telling you this is survivable. The number one way of being 100% sure is pre-crisis preparation. Shut up and stop finding a reason to not do it and start finding a reason to do it. Hi folks, Canadian Prepper here. Well, we got a very special guest today, one of the co-authors of this book, Nuclear War Survival Skills. This is the 2022 edition. You got to go and pick this book up. We have Stephen Harris here, who's a former science and technology vehicle development engineer who transitioned into consulting for elements of the U.S. government. He's a published author who is the protege of Crescent Kearney, who was the original author of that book that I just showed you and uh, has 30 years of preparedness uh, skills in the field. Stephen, maybe uh, tell people a little bit about yourself and uh, yeah, tell us a little bit about this book that you wrote. I met Crescent Carney in 1996 at the Doctors for Disaster Preparedness Conference and immediately fell in love with the guy. He is the consummate professional scientist. Edwin York, who's mentioned in the book, was a very good friend of mine, also a mentor of mine, and he was a developer of nuclear weapons, and he was at the Los Alamos test site in 19... He started there, I think, 42, all the way through the explosions, became a nuclear development engineer, and he's the one who developed all of our civil defenses that we had, so I worked very, very closely. And the man who designed the bombs knows how to design the protection against them. So a lot of that went into the book Nuclear War Survival Skills. And when they wrote the book, they would just put ads in newspapers and it's like family wanted for experiment for a week long. You get paid X amount of dollars and they would just volunteer for it. And in the, in the book, you'll see two college girls who volunteered for it. And they were told the scenario is nuclear weapon has just been dropped near your city. You got into your car, you went out to the country and evacuated. And all you have with you is this book. You got half a day to read the part of the book to pick what you want to out of your house and take with you and go and dig a shelter and and shelter from the radiation and the other effects. So this book was written absolutely for you to have not, only the stuff in your house and only this book and use expedient civil defense, which is everything that's around you, to be able to survive everything from trans-Pacific fallout to iodine falling from around the world and entering uh, the food chain, either through leafy vegetables or uh, milk or something you're drinking, and thus the need for potassium iodine to put good iodine into your thyroid so the radioactive iodine doesn't go into your thyroid. The book was written with the utmost of scientific integrity of the best of the scientists of the 70s and 80s. And that was really, really rigorous science back then. And the whole idea was for this book to be available in times of crisis to aid the American public and anyone else reading it to help them through a nuclear crisis. And Perfect. that is what I promised Chris and I would do is I would make this book freely available. I promised him this in 2003. I'd make this book freely available to the public around the world for free whenever there was nuclear disaster. Now we're looking at nuclear disaster of some type happening intimately, you know, could be happening right now, tomorrow, next week, before the new year or after the new year. It could be happening any time in there or in 10 years. And it's been 80 years since, you know, 1945. You know, that's when the last time we used nuclear weapons in, in anger. What is your current assessment of the situation right now? And where would you put the uh, risk level at? Risk level, 9 out of 10. 
maybe high, maybe you know nine and a half, ten out of ten. We're in the middle of a two and a half year global pandemic. We're in the middle of a billion people dying in the next three years from famine due to artificial shortages of fertilizer, uh, deglobalization, uh, transportation issues, and literally rolling ourselves back to 1992. Those uh, population levels, those aren't just my words. Those are the words of Peter Zion, which is a by far smarter geopopulation and economist than I am. And many others are echoing and saying the same thing as he is that we're facing. So you got a pandemic, you know, tens and tens of millions of people or more dead from the uh, global pandemic. We are in the middle of an upcoming famine that is going to be just absolutely devastating. People go, well, how bad is it going to be back in the United States? It's like, eh, we're going to have some famine. And, and people go, well, what's our shortages? I go, no, no, no. Stop using the word shortages. Outages. Unable to get. Unable to obtain. Out of stock. You know, it's what we're coming up. It's not a shortage. Shortage means I go down to Walmart and I, you know, another town and I buy it because my Walmart is out. This is an outage. Unavailable at any price. Not available. The crop did not come in. The amount of corn, the wheat, or whatever was going to be produced that's making your food that your animals eat, that you eat the animals, that you eat the food from, is not going to be there. And in the United States, we are very much going to notice it. Now, the rest of the world, principally Arabia and Africa <laughs> and parts of South America, are supplied directly out of Ukraine. Okay, It's not the Ukraine war that started this. I wrote a paper in November 2021 called The Possibility of a First World Famine and Swimming Out to Sea, which means, you remember, people used to commit suicide by swimming out to sea because they swim out until they are exhausted, change their mind that they want to live, turn back, and they couldn't turn back because they drown halfway back. And you know, I I would I really husband my words and and in this report and said, you know, we're like twenty percent chance and I put all the hypotheticals in there and you know, I sent it up the chain and the next thing I knew, like four days later I didn't call, I was like, you know, this think tank took up your paper and talked about it for four hours. I'm going, What? And they don't talk about, you know. They don't talk about anything except, you know, what's for lunch for four hours. We're, n we're not going to be able to cover all of this stuff today, guys. We're going to do our best to try to make it palatable and bite-sized. Uh, the important thing to take note of is that this is available for free in a digital format, like you said. And I would encourage people to do both because, you know, there's times when maybe all you have is your phone and you don't want to carry this big book around everywhere. What are some of the biggest hits of surviving a nuclear conflict? It's, it's totally survivable. People think one nuclear bomb goes off, it's the end of the world. And we've had over 2,400 nuclear detonations above and below the surface since the history of the nuclear weapons on the face of this planet. And we're still here. Mm -hmm. um, what, know, would you say, what would you say if uh, people push back and said, well, yeah, but those were spread out over 30, 40 years. Uh, they weren't concentrated as they would be in a all-out nuclear war what what would your response be to that nuclear bombs aren't that big you know when i was doing uh chemical biological and radiological work with ddp and connie chester and some other people we we're talking about chemical weapons and biological weapons and one of our nice our sayings was the nice thing about nuclear detonation is you know when one has gone off there's a bright light and big bang you don't know when a biological agent has gone off and we were talking about things a lot more deadly than COVID. We were talking about smallpox and tularemia and Ebola and everything else. Those, the biggest threat to man, ma to man on the planet right now, and always has been, is one, the virus, and is two, an asteroid hitting us. One does something every 10 to 20 to 30 million years. And the other one is perfectly capable of, of, of doing it sooner. Nuclear explosions just are not that big. See, you can't see a virus and you can't see radiation, but you can see the nuclear detonation so you can kind of relate to it. And then the thing that you can't see, the radiation, provides a great deal of the fear. And also back then we were talking about 10 and 20 megaton city flatteners coming down with 30 mile 
radius of detonation. Most of all of our bombs now are well under a megaton and well under a quarter megaton. And we even go lower down to one kiloton. Hiroshima and Nagasaki were 20-ish kilotons. And our aiming and everything is so precise now, we want that spot right there to disappear. And so most of our weapons are dial yield. They can dial in the yield they want from fraction of a kiloton all the way up to 250 kilotons to, to go off. There's air bursts, there's ground bursts, there's high altitude bursts, there's all different variants of it. And uh, it, it's the surprising thing, the majority of the uh, attack centers in the 80s and such was not the population centers. The first thing they went after was the two-mile airfields. The second thing they went two-mile-long airfields, which is where the bombers took off. The second thing they targeted was the missile fields. And the third thing they targeted was the highway intersections. Happens to be most of the highway intersections are in and around cities, and thus the cities get flattened. And they would probably do an airburst above like a major road intersection like I-75 and I-80, something like that. And why would they... they why would they do that exactly? You Before we uh, did our initial recording, you talked about something called fine fix and finish. Can you maybe explain what that means in military speak? The, the reason they go after the highway intersection is the military kill chain, politely put, is find, fix, and finish. You find the enemy, you fix them in place, and then you kill them. So when you go after the highway intersections, usually the railroads are next to the highways, you have fixed us in place. You have fixed Detroit into where Detroit is. You fixed Chicago into where Chicago is. You cannot escape Chicago through major roadways, major rail railways, et cetera. The two-mile runways are taken out. And so, like, you're in Chicago, you're pretty much fixed in Chicago unless you're hoofing it on out and everything else. So now you're fixed. And now you can either be left isolated or you can be finished. And that is the part of the military kill chain. The analysis part that goes into that, it's called the OODA loop, which is, if you go on Wikipedia, it's a fascinating thing to look at, O-O-D-A, called the OODA loop. Yes, uh, and uh, I, I think another probably primary target might be like, bridges and, and major highways that run through uh, very precarious terrain. Like here in Canada, through the mountains, there's only a couple highways. And were you to take out those highways, you'd completely disconnect two sides of the country. And the same yeah. could be true for a lot of bridges, I would presume, Ed, that would force people to be fixed into position. There are only 21 major bridge crossings at last count across the Mississippi River. And these are both rail bridges and highway bridges. If you took those out by any means, you've cut the country absolutely in half. In fact, there was one attack strategy. There was a decade ago, a barge that ran into a major bridge abutment and basically took the whole damn thing out. And it sent warning waves through the community is like, is this part of something bigger? Is this just an accident or is this an attempt to use um, non-military kinetic forces to take out a large part of our transportation infrastructure? In the, I think it was in the 90s or late or 80s, we had the fifth Great Lake form in the middle of the country. And it, it was huge if you see the satellite photos, literally like half the size of Lake Erie. And that took out a great deal of the bridges and all the traffic had to go either north or very south in order to get across the Mississippi. So one of our strongest assets in this country when it comes to commerce is our river network. It is one of the best in the world. But it's also a way of that nations have been historically divided and separated is you take is is you control the riverways, the waterways, the bridges, you take out the bridges. There were many battles fought in Germany over nothing but bridges. And in fact, the Battle of the Bulge was a race of who could destroy a bridge versus who could capture a bridge one after another. So you know, you are correct. There are certain passes and bridges and other places that are used to fix 
a target into one space. You cannot cross that mountain range unless you're going through that path. Yeah, and I think it's worth summarizing your your initial uh, myth that you talk about that nuclear war isn't survivable. And that's one of the opening statements in the book itself, because this is where yeah. uh, a lot of people's fatalism is going to prevent them from ever taking any sort of initiative on this. And the fact of the matter is, in all of the nuclear simulations I've seen, uh, especially the ones that are circulating on YouTube right now that are really popular and they're being uh, put on all the mainstream news websites, they're talking about deaths in the, the hundreds of millions. Well, you know, reality check, there's 8 billion people. So that means that, you know, billions of people are going to survive the initial uh, launches and uh, attacks. And so you're likely going to be one of those people, uh, depending on where you reside, of course. And because of the fact that the primary targets of any such incident, uh, the late Peter Pry talked about how the strategy with the Russians and the Chinese might be to take out all the military targets first, then hold the cities hostage as a bargaining tool to say, okay, like, you know, because we have such a, uh, there's such a discrepancy in the amount of nukes that they have compared to us, that once we had exhausted ours, they would say, okay, either you surrender, or we start nuking your cities. So there's definitely a potential to survive it. And that's the, the unfortunate part for a lot of people is that it's going to go out. They're going to go out with a whimper, not a bang. Yeah, it is uh, definitely a very survivable situation. And a lot of people think it's insurmountable and difficult. And they find I came up with a saying since the pandemic and I'm kind of harsh in this. And I tell people, shut up and stop finding a reason to not do it and start finding a reason to do it no matter what it is because if you tell someone what you've done a lot of people haven't done crap in their life and they'll come up and oh you can't do this you get food poisoning you'll get botulism yeah. you know someone might sue you you know they're just going to come and steal what you're doing this is said by everyone who hasn't done anything to everyone who wants to do anything and they made a mistake of telling someone don't tell people what you are going to do. Show yeah. people what you have done. Yeah. You be the example to other people because you and I can show everyone out there exactly how simple this is. It is as a simple lifestyle. I, we used to say it's a marathon, not a sprint. Now we might be saying, well, right now it's a 5K race, not a sprint. And working on it. Look, our grandparents lived this way. They didn't yeah. have the supply chain. And, you know, oranges at Christmas time were unheard of. They were a delicacy and a treat that my mother told me about. And uh, getting a box of oranges from Florida in the 1940s or 1930s was an unimaginable thing. And it's a thing of beauty that we have uh, available worldwide. Both Nate and I right now are telling you this is survivable. I am telling you, you can do this. It is within your power. It is not hard. And it's like, give us your hand. Nate and his other guests and all of us will walk you through this step by step by step. And this is something that you can survive. It's nothing harder than what your grandparents did when they were growing up. Yeah, and that's one of the things that I, I'd say in the West, our priorities are not really too straight. Like in Ukraine right now, living so close to the war, being on the front line, they're forced to, you know, uh, Ron was just there and he was telling me some stories about uh, how the people have adapted to that that situation and the things here that we're overly sensitive about like like you say the example with botulism and how i always get these comments about people who are concerned about you know maybe some heavy metals in the water or you know that the one in a million chance of getting botulism from eating expired food or something like that and these things are things that are our, our ancestors and uh, like the pioneers or you know people who uh, right now in the world you know, are, are constantly dealing with and have dealt with and, you know, but we're overly sensitive to the small stuff. And one of the things that you wrote in your book here that really caught my attention is in chapter 11, when you talk about light, you're criticizing uh, the U.S. government's recommendations 
to people. And I've always mm-hmm. kind of criti- criticized there. I, I call it like a Mickey Mouse sort of prepping, Disney prepping. And you say here that uh, you're talking about how uh, their advice is not to use a candle because you might light a fire, right, in an emergency. And uh, I like how you summarize this here. You say, you're in a life or death disaster with possible nuclear detonations burning tens of square miles per event with radioactive fallout, radionucleotides in the food and water, and you might drink all of the other horrors that come with nuclear detonation. And some lawyer behind the ready.gov website is worried you are going to start a fire with matches in a candle. And that just puts it in perspective how, you know, pampered of a society we've become that we're, we don't have our priorities straight. I mean, when it comes down to it, when it comes down to survival, people will do <laughs> whatever it takes. And uh, I think people will surprise themselves also. And I, I always hear this sort of fatalistic uh, speak from people who say, well, if it happens, you know, I don't want to survive through that. But the fact is, it's going to happen and you're still going to be alive and all your instincts are going to be present to survive. And uh, then you're going to be a potential liability and a drag on those around you. So it's, it's imperative that people take this stuff seriously. Now, uh, what about uh, getting on with the myths about surviving nuclear war? What about fallout from food and water? Let's talk a little bit about fallout. And you can just kind of expound on it in any way you want. But uh, there's obviously this idea that people think, well, everything's going to be irradiated and, you know, it's just going to be a toxic wasteland forever and the end. What do you say to that? The only thing that makes something radioactive is either by having a neutron particle hitting it, it can then become an isotope. I mean, that is how uranium turns into lead over a billion years as it goes through a radiation decay chain and it actually becomes one element after another after another after another like uranium to neptunium uranium to plutonium to neptunium you know it goes down the decay chain and it ends at lead and lead is where it stops you know lead used to be uh uranium at one time so if you want to make something radioactive you either hit it with neutrons, which happens in a nuclear reaction. It doesn't happen really anywhere else at scale. The other thing is you put a radioactive particle in it or on it. And the nice thing is if we look at radioactive particles as a mosquito, Nate, do you have mosquitoes in Canada? Oh, yes. We have a lot of them. Yeah. Can yeah. you see them? Do you hear them? Oh, yes. Do you understand them? Do I don't understand them. them. Well, maybe I do understand them from a survival point of view, but I don't like them. Right. You understand them. That's the key. See, there's a fear quadrant that goes from seen and understood to unseen and understood. Now, a mosquito, we see and understand. So are we really that scared of it? Not really. Okay. A hurricane, seen and very well understood. We can see the storm coming. We know what it looks like. We know it's a lot of wind and rain. So we see it and we understood it. We're not that scared of it. Thunder and lightning. We see it. Do we always understand what lightning is other than that it's bad? No. So that's a little higher on the fear quadrant. The fourth part of the fear quadrant, I'm jumping over to third, is unseen understood. If you want to scare people, you scare people with something they can't see and something they don't understand. They do not understand viruses, nor can they see bacteriological or viruses. So they are scary, rightfully so. People cannot see radiation without a, a, a meter or some other type of device, and they generally don't understand it. So if I take an unseen, understood thing, and I make an analogy of it to something that you see and understand like a mosquito you become more understanding and less scared of it because I hate the term stay safe, stay safe, stay safe, which means do nothing, stay home and pray that nothing happens to you. I prefer make it safe. You make it safe with knowledge, information, knowledge, experience, expertise, you know, doing it yourself, testing, training, etc. Simple 
radiological meters that are available to us today allow us to now see the radionucleotide particles. Let's say you went outside and you came in and you scuffed up the dirt on your driveway and there was some fallout either from a Fukushima type incident or a nuclear detonation and it was on your shoes. Well, you come into the house and you take off your shoes and uh, your wife goes, wait. And she takes a little simple Geiger counter and goes over sh your shoes and goes, duh, 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 duh. And she looks at the reading and it's like, you got particles in there. You got particles on your shoes, Nate. Take them outside, wash them off, let's check them again. They count, you chunk them back in. And it's like, no, you don't have an uh, a bad reading on, on the Geiger counter. You can now see and understand that thing that is unseen and understood like you can see and understand the mosquito. mosquito, The Geiger counter, the nuke alert, the low range meter, the high range meters, those all help you see the invisible and make them seen and understood. And that's what we want to teach you, either through nuclear war survival skills, any of your other experts, me, you, etc., that it is only a little bit of knowledge away. It's not difficulty difficult. You don't need to have a scientific degree. You don't need to have a life in the sciences. If you can learn to avoid and slap those damn skeeters when you hear them and feel them landing on your arm or your leg, you can as easily learn to avoid radioactive threats to it, either, either through ingestion, which would be the radioactive iodine primarily, or surface contamination, or it fall out and being outside. How much is outside? How much is inside? What about the, uh, to, to talk about, you know, how long would a person, like, just to really go to the bare basics here, if a nuclear detonation went off, how long would a person need to stay in a bunker and before, you know, it... Um, dissipated enough that it could be we, safe. Are we talking about the missile fields being attacked? Or are we talking about just like just an in, airburst over Los Angeles? Just in, Los in Angeles? general, just so the average person can understand a bit better. Because a lot of people are under the assumption that the bombs are going to go off and we're going to have to stay underground for months on end. So can you just maybe demystify that a little bit? Anywhere from nothing to three days before you go outside for any portion of exposure and then two weeks at most and you can spend a lot more time outside the higher the year half-life oh it's got a five billion year half-life or it's got a 90 day or a 90 hour half-life the shorter the half-life the higher the energy and the amount of energy it is putting out and the more dangerous it is to you the longer the half-life the less dangerous it is to you, unless you're going to eat it. You don't want to. You don't want to eat it. Okay, that even goes for lead. You don't want to eat lead. The stuff that's happening that has the high radiation that's falling out of the sky, and sometimes it falls down the size of marbles, depending on how close you are to a nuclear detonation and whether it's a ground burst or an air burst. You can be outside for minutes, hours, and spend the rest of the day in a shelter or in a basement. All depends. It's like, let's say you are getting one rad an hour outside in, in, in the ambient. And inside your basement, you're set up to get one one hundredth that amount. So you're getting, sorry, one one thousand, one one hundredth is an easier number. So you're getting 10 millirads an hour. Um, and you might have an area set up for sleeping and, relax and re relaxing that has a higher radiation factor with it. And you might get up and go upstairs and use the toilet or the shower or something else if that infrastructure is still working. And then go back downstairs. You might get upstairs and go get some food and make a meal. But then you're going back down in your shelter. So, so we'll, it's, we'll... It's, it's the exposure and the time exposure and the time okay so we'll talk a bit about some of the terms you use there in just a minute rads and stuff like that um would it be safe to say that your mosquito metaphor might somewhat apply here in that i'm thinking of like one mosquito bite not a big deal but if you get bit a million times 
then obviously that's a really big deal, right? You could potentially even die in some cases. Now, if with the radiation metaphor, and you could correct me if I'm wrong here, maybe... maybe I, like your, I like your metaphor a lot. I like it okay. a lot. It's, um, it's good thinking. Maybe you could be stung by, say, a thousand mosquitoes a day, uh, you know, over a long period of time, and that would be like your exposure. Uh, so long as it wasn't concentrated into one big dose, is it safe to say that I'm on the right track there? Absolutely. It is, it is an excellent, understandable metaphor. And what we just need to do is put some basic numbers to people that they don't forget. And they're not hard. I mean, I have a, a sequence I teach people of 325 and 100, and they don't forget it. And they go, okay, I got the basics. And um, yeah, the mosquito metaphor, uh, like you said, being stung by one mosquito, no big problem. Being stung by 10, you know, tied to a tree naked in a swamp, you know, and, and being eaten alive, that can be a problem. You can do the same thing with bee stings as well. Um, and it's like, okay, I'm going to get stung by a thousand mosquitoes. Are you going to get stung by a thousand mosquitoes over six months? Or are you going to get stung by a thousand mosquitoes over six hours? You know, there is a big difference in there. Part of that big difference enters into something that has been declared false called linear no threshold, which says all radiation to your body is cumulative. And basically the analogy is if you jump off a thousand foot cliff, Nate, you think you're going to live? Probably not. No. It's called LD100, LD100%. Linear no threshold says if one person jumps off a thousand foot cliffs, and that one person dies, then if a thousand people jump off a one foot curb, one of those thousand people is going to die. And that is not the way radiation in most cases works. It is not a linear no threshold situation. Uh, so what would the uh, effects be? One of the other concerns of preppers is what are the effects of uh, nuclear power plants shutting down going to be if the spent fuel rods can't be kept cooled and the backup generators don't have a fuel supply what will in your assessment uh, could be the potential uh, radiation risk from such events a lot worse than a nuclear bomb it has the potential to the amount of radiation is measured. The amount of radiation, okay, you got the rate of radiation, and then you got the amount of radiation. Like your garden hose puts out five gallons a minute, but you let it run for 20 days. So it's five times 24 times 20. And that is generally measured in a term which I'm going to kind of slaughter, depending on which way you say it. It's called barracles. And it's the amount of radiation release. The amount of total rea radiation released from Chernobyl uh, was by far more than Fukushima. And Fukushima was uh, a fair amount of radiation. The amount, the quantity of radiation re released over a period of time, like let's say four months out of the ZNPP reactors, if all six of them blew their tops, and keep in mind, they're not blowing their tops from radiation or nuclear explosion. They're they're blowing their tops from hydrogen. Those are the nuclear reactors in Ukraine for people who don't know. I'm sorry. Yes, those are the six reactors out of I think the 14 total in in Ukraine right now. Yeah. Um, they generally require grid power to operate. Uh, the absolute walk on water geniuses that run these nuclear reactors. I have been to them. I have been inside them. I know the people, at least in the continental United States, they are some of the most dedicated, serious, intelligent people you would ever want. And they don't want anything bad to happen. They will. And as proven in, in actually Chernobyl, they will sacrifice their life to protect the greater population. And that has occurred. But the, the total quantity of radiation coming out of a single point or multiple points or a multi single point location like that can far be larger than that of a nuclear detonation, especially when we're talking about months of release before they can try to get a handle on it. 
And that does pose a, a, a significant problem to people because it's more like the fire hose. You're getting uh, you're getting wet, and you're getting wet on a daily basis, depending upon where the wind is blowing and what's de being deposited. In that case, you have a continual source of radioactive iodine, which is one of the byproducts, along with a whole family of other radioactive nucleotides being deposited and put into the air and falling down. I mean, I literally measured the radiation from Fukushima when it went over Pittsburgh and it rained. Uh, the cloud, if anything goes Fukushima in this world, it will be tracked more accurately than the biggest damn hurricane that has ever happened. They will know where that thing is more accurately than a hurricane. In this case, I, I knew it was over Pittsburgh. I had an industrial shop there. It rained that day, and it rained on hundreds of thousands, if not millions of square feet of roof, ran down all the gutters, collected in a puddle, and I had a meter sensitive enough to read it, a background radiation meter. And the radiation in that puddle was three to four times background radiation, and it lasted for about a week. Because it was probably iodine and the half-life died out pretty quickly. But, you know, that's not a dangerous level. It's like the level you can read and the level that's dangerous are two different things. And it's like the exposure of the radiation to the body at that low level is not a thing at all. You get much more flying in an airplane or even going through some antique shops with radioactive glazing on pottery and radium dials, you know, some areas of Colorado have a high background radiation, five, eight times the background radiation that you and I are receiving right now, and it's no big deal. However, if you ingest any of those particles into your body, and they are now in your body, in your intestines, in your stomach, and they're that far away from all the cellular membranes and they're doing an alpha or even a beta emission, let alone a gamma, you're getting a direct close radioactive dose from those items in your body. And that is the problem. So being exposed to one thing of what's called whole body radiation versus radiation that you are drinking or consuming are two different things. Now, radioactive well, okay. iodine, you can protect from. Uh, that was going to be the my others. next question. How can people uh, protect themselves? And we'll probably go into more depth about the different types of iodine. But uh, what, what utility is potassium iodide for nuclear emergencies? Why should people have this in their survival kits? The thyroid is dependent upon iodine to produce the chemicals that it produces for your body. It uses iodine as its feedstock. Now, it doesn't care what the type of iodine is, but it stores it and holds it for a number of period of days uh, before it's replenished. And it's replenished through our diet on a regular basis, every from eating, eating things that contain iodine naturally, or there's a little bit of it put into our salt, which has been a, a tremendous addition to human health of increase in iodine levels in people. Mm. You, you cannot use table salt, iodine table salt to protect yourself. It's not enough. You know, let's say it holds an amount of K of, of iodine. In it. Let's say it's that this much just being subjective. Okay. Yeah. And it goes down a little bit and gets refilled and goes down a little bit and gets refilled through our daily diet. Well, if that gets filled up, with radioactive iodine then that is in this case i believe it's an alpha emitter it's sitting there right in your thyroid and it's doing an emission directly into the tissue of the thyroid over time you're getting a direct dose i mean that far away from all of your tissue which is not good rather it being three feet away or six feet away or one foot away it's that far away which is like you can see right here that's like nothing far away so you're talking about the iodine that's given off from nuclear events correct now if you fill your thyroid on a daily basis with non-radioactive iodine which is called potassium iodide 
is the chemical name for it. But colloquial in the language and average people, its atomic symbol is a K and an I, and most people call that potassium iodine. And unlike the very horrible thing of why people call salt, oh, that's sodium. And it's like, no, it's sodium chloride. They Many times right. they'll say they're passing out iodine and everything else, and that's not true. The compound is not the elements. If you know how bad sodium is and how bad chlorine is, you know that table salt exhibits none of the behaviors of its individual constitute elements that make up that chemical compound. Same thing with potassium chloride, magnesium chloride, Epsom salts, magnesium sulfate, plaster paris, calcium sulfate. It, it's not the, uh, the, it does not have the individual characteristics of, of the individual atomic elements that's in it. So if you fill up your thyroid with a daily dose of good potassium iodine that's not radioactive, then when you do ingest radioactive iodine, it just goes right past your thyroid, goes through your kidneys, and you piss it out, you know, within hours or half a day. And it, it's like it's in your system, and it doesn't have days of residence time. It's got hours, and you piss it out, and away it goes. And most iodine is not a problem after 10 to 100 days, at so, least. It has a, it has a very short half-life to it. So how much of this stuff then would a person need if there was a worst-case scenario where we had a full-on launch of everything we have, you know, and, uh, you know, maybe a few hit major cities were hit, but, you know, there's some nuclear actors going off. Uh, that haven't been maintained because of the, the nuclear blast and, of course, all the nuclear bombs. How much do you think a person should have on hand? And I guess we might as well, because we're on the topic, talk about the different types. I had Dr. Bones and Nurse Amy on, who are doctors, and they... I, 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 I know Joel Alton and, uh, and Amy very well. They're very yeah. good friends. And They're they excellent. They're excellent. They're the height of medical excellence in the field. And yeah. so is uh, Ron Hubbard at Atlas Survival Shelters. They're a finer, <laughs> hardly a finer quality person of, other than all those people you you could have talked to. You could give Ron Hubbard a briefcase of $5 million and say, Ron, will you put this in your safe for me? And you come back five years later and he goes, I got your briefcase for you. I mean, there's, I hardly, a, there's hardly a person of higher integrity. Yeah, than, they're good people. Uh, than, than Ron Hubbard and or uh, Doc Bones and Nurse Amy. They're all the highest professionalism and integrity uh, in the field that they're working in. I agree. And so they did a video with us recently where they're showing people how to use iodine because when this whole thing started, there was a shortage of the FDA-approved uh, potassium iodide, the Thyrosafe. And uh, they did a video showing people how to use iodine. Now, they require the they all obviously they have the expertise on how to administer that sort of thing um but for the average person how much potassium iodide would they need if we're talking about a worst case scenario it is very well documented documented both by the fda oak ridge national laboratories and it's in this book on how to take it in a powdered format in a solution as well as the pills and everything else. Uh, let me tell you, the coated pills, whether you're using Thyrosafe, IOSAT, or anything, and here is like a generic that's available on Amazon. There's lots of them. Note, you want potassium iodide, okay? You do not want potassium with iodine. You want potassium iodide. The child dose is 65 milligrams per day for 10 to 14 days, or as long as local officials and or your personal physician is telling you to take it. If you have an allergy to shellfish or an iodine sensitivity, you cannot at all take it. And there is really no substitute for you. You're, you're stuck. But this stuff, and I'm opening this here, KI, you think salt? Ever take a mouthful of salt? Okay, KI in its raw form is a thousand times worse in tasting. But these little tablets that you get from Thyrosafe or anyone else, 
They're like coated aspirin. They got a little coating on them that makes that your taste buds not taste it while it's going by your tongue and down into your stomach. And nuclear war survival skills covers any side effects that you might have. And believe me, they are absolutely minimal. Here's an example of iodine in a powdered format that you might use. You can also buy in powdered format up to a kilogram of it on Amazon. And believe me, that's enough to take care of your entire block. The adult dose is 130 milligrams per day, which would be four drops of a saturated solution of KI in water, or it would be uh, two 65 milligram um, tablets. And that is enough to fill up your thyroid such that any radioactive iodine that you either inhale, accidentally drink, or accidentally eat is not going into your system. And Nate, you know the simplest me method as well as I do on the know how not to get radioactive iodine from food and water in your body. And that is having food and water that you got before there was a nuclear incident that is perfectly 100% safe to drink because it didn't magically float over into your water storage or your food storage or your freeze dried or your canned goods or your staples or whatever else that you wanted in your house, and then you then ate it if, if they were sealed. So the number, one, the number one way is of being 100% sure is pre-crisis preparation. And Hiroshima and Nagasaki were 20-ish kilotons, and we're talking about 55,000. That is a ginormous, humongous weapon. The best way to support this channel is to support yourself by gearing up at CanadianPreparedness.com, where you'll find high-quality survival gear at the best prices, no junk, and no gimmicks. Use discount code PREPPINGGEAR for 10% off. Don't forget, the strong survive, but the prepared thrive. Stay safe.